I'm Georgos Bourogiannis. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Museum of uh, Mediterranean and Near Eastern Antiquities, also known as Middelhaf's Museum in Stockholm. And the title of the paper is Cypriot Evidence in the Early Iron Age Aegean, an Alternative View from the Cyclades. In the past decades, archaeological research witnessed an increased interest in the role of sea trade, contacts and cultural interaction. New excavations, articles and monographs, as well as the organization of international symposia and museum exhibitions, have contributed to our improved understanding of the Mediterranean's past and of how contacts were shaped, developed and orchestrated. Much of this interest has been supported by fresh knowledge of excavated sites in the Aegean, Cyprus and the Syro-Palestinian littoral, and by better understanding of imports and their circulation. Regarding the Aegean, the re-establishment of contacts with the East Mediterranean after the demise of the Late Bronze Age palatial system seems to have occurred earlier than hitherto believed. Cyprus must have played a pivotal role in this process. My primary goal today is to look at Cypriot and Cyprus-related evidence from the Cyclades, the island group that dominates the centre of the Aegean Sea. Yet before doing so, it is useful to recall the initial stages of the early Iron Age Cypro-Aegean interplay. Contacts between the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean have a long tradition going back to the earliest part of the Late Bronze Age and beyond. Excavations at Trianda in Rhodes, for example, have produced Cypriot pottery of the White Slip One, Base Ring One and Red Lustrous Wares found in well-stratified Late Minon 1A to 1B contexts. Cypriot imports are accompanied by local imitations made in Rhodian clay, attesting to the relative popularity of Cypriot ceramics in Late Bronze Age roads. Rhodes lies directly on major sea routes and offers the first safe anchorage for ships sailing from Cyprus after having bypassed the rugged and dangerous coastline of southwest Anatolia. The famous Luburun shipwreck, this magnificent archaeological attestation of the mixed cargo and the importance of Cypriot copper ingots transferred by a late Bronze Age vessel, is located a few miles to the east of Megisti, Castellorizo, yet in Turkish territorial waters, thus not too far from Rhodes. What followed after the end of the Late Bronze Age remains less visible in the archaeological record. Time restriction does not allow me to enter the Greek Dark Age dispute. I shall only make a couple of observations. First, it is becoming increasingly clear that the so-called Dark Age was neither as dark nor as long as we had originally assumed. On the contrary, there are clear signs of recovery at early stages of the early Iron Age, although certain parts of the Aegean recovered later than others. And second, Cyprus experienced no dramatic break between the Late Bronze and the Early Iron Ages. The paucity of data after the end of the Bronze Age implies a change in the frequency of long maritime journeys in the Mediterranean. Unless our current understanding is totally misleading, it seems that in the early 11th century BC, the Cypriots were perhaps the only ones who continued to undertake long maritime journeys, even occasionally, following the same sea routes and possibly for the same reasons as before. A large island by Mediterranean standards, fertile and rich in minerals, as Strabo so aptly summarized, Cyprus had all it needed to retain a prosperous economy even at times of major upheavals. A few Cypriot objects found sporadically in sub-Mycenaean contexts, combined with a striking absence of Near Eastern imports during the same period, suggest that the Cypriots were those primarily responsible for linking the Aegean to the East Mediterranean, although contacts were not yet systematic. Indicative of this prelude is a small Cypriot bronze bowl from a sub-Mycenaean burial at Kanakia on Salamis, today in the Archaeological Museum of Piraeus, and of a Cypriot bronze amphoroid crater from an 11th century BC Tholos tomb at the valley of Amari in Crete, of a type that was current in Cyprus in the 12th and 11th centuries BC. One of the closest parallels is the crater from the late Cypriot III tomb 40 at Kurion Kaloriziki, used as a funerary urn. Moving southwards, the excavation carried out in 2004 at the site of Agia Gath in Rhodes brought to light an important sub-Mycenaean cemetery dating between the second half of the 12th and the middle of the 11th century BC. Of particular importance was the Pit Cave Tomb 3, 
a richly furnished female burial dating around the middle of the 11th century. It contained pottery, faience, bronze, gold and ivory objects, as well as a Cypriot bottle of the proto-white painted ware. Products of this ware are rather exceptional in the Aegean, so their presence in Rhodes is noteworthy. Just a few miles south of Agia Gathi, at the site of Pilona, a locally produced imitation of a proto-white painted bottle was also found in an early 11th century BC context. This picture changes considerably in the 10th century BC, when contacts between the Aegean and the East Mediterranean, including Cyprus, are becoming more regular. Unsurprisingly, the areas dominating the discussion are Euboea, the Dodecanese, mostly Rhodes, and Crete. While what seems to have made Rhodes and Crete attractive at those early stages was their location, both islands were essential ports of call for the vessel sailing along the east-west maritime routes, Euboea was most probably a destination per se, as well as a redistribution centre, and had a more reciprocal engagement in the process. Lefkandi, for example, was a thriving settlement where prestige objects important from the east were in high demand by the local elites. What Eubea could offer in return were the agricultural products from the fertile Lelantine plain and metal from its iron ores mentioned by Strabo. These products could support a mutual exchange between Eubeans and the people from the Eastern Mediterranean. In the case of Eubea, Crete and the Dodecanese, pottery evidence provides a clear outline of contacts with Cyprus. Certain features in the ceramic repertoire of the three aforementioned areas have been associated with Cyprus and seem to imply rather regular contacts between Cyprus and the Aegean from the 10th to the early 7th century BC. I'm going to illustrate a few examples of this phenomenon. A middle protogeometric hydria from Scubri's tomb 51 at Lefkandi, dating to the first half of the 10th century, bears a vibrant iconographic decoration on its shoulder. The two antithetically seated archers create a unique decorative composition that deviates from the austere local ceramic tradition. The most likely source of inspiration for this scene is Cyprus. Unlike the Aegean, where human figures are exceptional prior to the late geometric style, Cyprus displays a broad iconographic tradition during the first stages of the Cypriot geometric period. We need to search no further than the white painted one bowl from tomb 58 at Palepa Foscales, with the representation of two archers, usually identified as Heracles and Aeolos, and a large snake that is perhaps a representation of Lernian Hydra. Cypriot pottery imports at Lefkandi do not appear before the late 10th century with this bichrome 2 jug from the late protogeometric tomb 22 at Palia Perivoglia. Moving to Crete, the impact of Cyprus, particularly on Cretan pouring vessels, is traceable already in the early 10th century. A homogeneous class of small juglets of Cretan manufacture, made in coarse red micaceous clay and dating from around 1200 BC, are clearly inspired from Cypriot black slip originals. Vessels of this class normally carry incised vertical ribs or, less commonly, groves on the body. This is a conscious attempt to imitate both the shape and decoration of Cypriot jacklets, although no imported Cypriot black slip products have hitherto been found in Crete. What may be viewed as a corresponding phenomenon in the Dodecanese, primarily at Rhodes and Kos, is a group of vases dating mostly to the late 10th and early 9th centuries BC. Their decoration and technical features are clearly influenced by products of the Cypriot white painted ware, as evidenced by the whitish or buff slip and the dark brown paint of the decoration. This conscious Dotecanesian attempt to reproduce the effect of Cypriot white painted involved only two shapes, also of Cypriot inspiration, flasks and bird or animal shaped ascoi. A very interesting bird ascos with plastically modelled wings on the two sides of the body was produced in the late protogeometric tomb 5 at the Seraglio Cemetery of Kos. It is made of local micaceous orange clay but its surface is fully coated in a fine whitish slip, while decoration is added in dark brown paint. Typologically similar ascoi occur in Cyprus already in the proto-white painted ware, with their production continuing uninterrupted into the supergeometric period. Dating to the beginning of the 9th century BC, tomb 141 at the Alysos, Rhodes, produced two identical flasks made of local clay. 
The arrangement of the radially, uh, the, uh, radially positioned crosshatch triangles on the two vessels is attested in the proto-white painted ware of Cyprus and continues in more elaborate forms in the Cypriogeometric period. An animal shaped as cause from the same burial also resembles Cypriot vessels in both shape and decoration. The next stage of this process dates to the late 9th and primarily to the 8th century BC. It is marked by a sizable group of Cypriot slow pouring vessels, mostly of the black on red ware, and their locally produced imitations. Even though the distribution of black on red in the Aegean has been wide, it is only at Rhodes, Kos, and Knossos where this phenomenon is more consistent and where close imitations of the ware occurred in the 8th century. What has been remarkably absent from the discussion so far is, of course, the Cyclades. Is it possible that the Cypriots, or at least their products, reached the early Iron Age Aegean on a regular basis, yet they ignored the islands right in its centre? It is true that the islands of the Cyclades are, not, are in most cases small and rather barren, yet they are rich in minerals and provide safe anchorages that could protect ships from the strong northern winds. So there must be other reasons why Cypriot evidence becomes elusive in the case of the Cyclades. One of them is the lack of comprehensive publications or, in certain cases, the erroneous assessment of the archaeological evidence, particularly in the case of old excavations that took place well before Cypriot archaeology was properly studied and published. Three islands have produced most of the evidence that will be discussed today – Delos, Naxos and Thera. Our little sail will start from the influential island of Delos and Drinia, right next to it, that, despite its unassuming size, dominates the centre of the Aegean Sea. Two fragmentary Cypriot black and red two imports, a trefoil rim jug and a bottle-shaped juglet, were found in the late 19th century in the so-called purification pit of Rinia. Published by Dugas and Romeos in 1934, the two Cypriot vessels belonged to a late geometric burial or burials of Delos and were removed to neighboring Rhenia during the 426 BC purification of Delos by the Athenians. Unfortunately, it is no longer possible to fully recover the original context of the two Cypriot vases, although we can be fairly certain of their burial character. Black on red ware was certainly known in the Cyclades already in the Middle Geometric period. A black on red rich necked juglet was found in a child burial at the cemetery of Tragea near the village of Cicalario, and I'm grateful to Dr. Xenia Haralambidu for sharing these photos with me. The juglet was deposited in a child burial that was adjacent to the rectangular construction number 11, possibly Perivolos. The Cypriot vase dates to the first half of the 8th century BC, Middle Geometric II, on the basis of the pottery associated with it. Yet our main source of Cypriot or Cyprus-related evidence from Naxos is situated a few miles south of the island's capital at the site of Hyria. The second temple of Dion Dionysus at Hyria, dating between 730 and 690 BC, produced a number of locally made pots that have been viewed as indicative of contacts between Naxos and Cyprus. Parts of four fragmentary Naxian vases were discovered in the deeper layers of Temple II that dates to the last quarter of the 8th century. The two pictures on the right part of the slide are illustrations of the same fragment. Despite their small size, they seem to follow the type of the Attic Middle Geometric II crater and they reflect the atticizing tradition of the late geometric Naxian pottery. What is distinctively non-Attic is their decoration. The sets of small concentric circles in combination with thin horizontal stripes are very popular decorative elements of the pottery of Cyprus, especially during the Cypriogeometric III and Cypriarchaic I period. Noticeably, a similar arrangement is found on the decoration of an unpublished late geometric jack fragment from Grotta at Naxos, excavated in 1997. Although the fabric is Naxian, the treatment of the surface and the decoration display a strong Cypriot influence and have been associated with black and red trefoil rimmed jacks. At the southern corner of Temple III at Tyria, dating to the first half of the 7th century BC, a wheel-made bottle-shaped vase was found among other drinking vessels. The vase is made of Naxian clay and dates around 700 to 690 BC. On the front part of its neck, there is a plastically modelled human face. The vessel clearly portrays a female figure, as the roughly executed breasts confirm. 
The anthropomorphic lekythos has its arms bent and held close to the upper body. Although anthropomorphic vessels and figurines have a long tradition in the Aegean, as in the case of this female figurine with a similar gesture from the Mycenaean Acropolis of Midea dating to the 13th century BC, the source of inspiration for the Naxian lekythos has been sought in the Eastern Mediterranean, namely in Cyprus and Phoenicia. The Naxian vase is contemporary with Cyproarchaic anthropomorphic jugs and roughly contemporary with North Syrian jugglets that bear the same decoration, and here is an imported example from a late geometric tomb at Pythekusai. Since both trends have been closely imitated in the Dodecanese during the late 8th and the early 7th centuries BC, and I shall return to this shortly, it is possible that the idea of a plastically modelled face on a pottery vase reached the Cyclades via the Dodecanese rather than directly from Cyprus. If the deity worshipped at Tyria was indeed Dionysus, as the excavator of the site has argued, then the anthropomorphic vase could be a crude representation of Ariadne, and we do have evidence from Iria to suggest that a second, female deity was also worshipped there. Moreover, Plutarch recounts a story he attributes to Peon, the early Hellenistic historian from Cyprus, according to which Ariadne died at Amathus and was venerated there as Ariadne Aphrodite. Although this tradition is later than the vase from Naxos and somewhat obscure, it does yield an additional link between Ariadne, Aphrodite, Cyprus and Naxos. Staying on Naxos, one of the most intriguing finds of the Temple of Iria was the fragmentary clay mask of a bearded male. The estimated complete height of the mask is around 22 cm. Made in Naxian clay, slipped and decorated in dark paint with stripes and a chain of lozenges, according to the Naxian pottery style, the mask was found in a context that dates between the last third of the 8th and the early 7th century BC. Similar finds are extremely rare in the Aegean, especially at such an early date. A few fragments of life-sized terracotta masks are known from a sacred Vothros at Tyrins, presumably connected to the sanctuary of Hera. The pottery in the Bothros dates to the late geometric and subgeometric period, yet unlike the mask from Naxos, the eyes of the Tyrins masks are not cut through, although a wearer could probably see out of the mouth. Yet the most remarkable corpus of life-sized terracotta masks was excavated at the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia in Sparta. The Spartan masks date to the late 7th and mostly to the 6th century BC, thus they are later than the Naxian example. They fall into moon ma two main categories, the grotesque or grimacing masks and the male masks often interpreted as representations of an idealized hero. The latter, in particular, have been viewed as depictions of Orthia's consort, especially since other iconographic elements from the sanctuary also suggest some sort of sacred marriage, a, a Nieros Gamos, possibly of Aristeos, and here is an ivory plaque from Sparta, son of Apollo and Cyrene, a male deity of flocks and agriculture. Regardless of the details of the religious practice at the temple of Artemis Orthia, the masks provide a very clear link to Phoenician, Punic and Cyprian traditions. Back to Naxos, the mask from the area has been associated with Cypriot anthropomorphic masks, and indeed the iconography of a Cypriot geometric one mask from Kition stands really close to the Naxian example. Similar masks are of course also known from the Levant, as in the case of this handsome mask slightly under life size that was purchased at Achtsif and illustrates the bearded hero of the Phoenician mainland. I'm not going deeper into the issue of Phoenician and Cypriot masks and their role in ritual performances, not least because Erin Averett masterfully did so in her recently published article in the American Journal of Archaeology. I'm only going to stress that Cyprus played an important role in the distribution or revival of this custom. Certainly, the dense distribution and increase of masking evidence in Cyprus between the Cypro geometric III and Cypro classical period, the same time span to which the Naxian mask belongs, is not fortuitous. Our last stop in the Cyclades is Thera. The so called Schiff's grave at Ensign Thera, published by Dragendorf in 1903, was actually part of the Vothros or Apothetes of the Sanctuary of Aphrodite. The majority of finds recovered in the Vothros date to the end of the late geometric and to the archaic period. Among them, the upper part of the neck and the rim of a Cypriot black and red juglet, while particularly interesting is the neck fragment of what appears to be a Dodecanesian imitation of black and red, 
as is suggested by the, the quality of the slip, the fugitive paint, and the micaceous orange clay. Although the shirt from Thera is very fragmentary, it seems to follow the type of the elongated trifoil lipped oinokoe with narrow cylindrical neck that occur mostly in subgeometric contexts of the Dodecanese, at Rhodes, Kos, Nisiros, Astipalea, as well as at Knossos and the Lefthernine Crete, where they're viewed as Dodecanesian imports. Sometimes found together with early Proto-Corinthian pottery, these oinokoi represent a short-lived creation of the potters of the Dodecanese, influenced by the shape of Phoenician trifoil-lipped jugs. Thera is the only place in the Cyclades where this slightly peculiar group is attested, offering additional evidence in support of contacts between the islands and the Dodecanese in the early 7th century BC. The cemetery of Selada has also produced two fragmentary limestone statuettes of seated female figures with their feet resting on a footstool, now deposited in the island's museum. Made of the soft limestone of Akrotiri, the statuettes were dated to the 2nd and 3rd quarters of the 6th century BC respectively. Published in 2014, they were viewed as the work of a local artisan who was familiar both with earlier and contemporary Cypriot art from which he copied the intended decoration of the figurines Hemation. Acquaintance with the Ionian plastic and choroplastic art was also acknowledged and is further supported by three enthroned kurotrophoi made of limestone at dating to the late 7th century BC also from the apothetis of the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Given the abundance of Cypriot and Cyprianizing limestone and terracotta statuettes at Samos and Rhodes, it is possible that Cypriot trends reached Thera via one of these islands rather than directly from Cyprus. Noticeably, the Lindian Chronicle, dating to the 1st century BC, suggests that Rhodians were among the original settlers at the Theran colony of Cyrene in Libya, thus providing an additional setting for interaction between the inhabitants of the two islands. Some early 7th century Rhodian terracotta figurines and some possibly Rhodian subgeometric pottery from Cyrene may yield archaeological support for an early Rhodian practice presence there. Although by no means impressive, the evidence from the Cyclades clearly outlines the presence of Cypriot imports and the local acquaintance with trends and er artistic notions originating in Cyprus. Yet, unlike other parts of the Aegean, where Cypriot or Cyprianizing evidence is traceable almost from the beginning of the early Iron Age, in the Cyclades this is mostly a late geometric, subgeometric and early archaic phenomenon. This somewhat belated Cycladic response to the influence of Cyprus, as well as certain East Aegean elements traceable in the archaeological record of Naxos and Thera, imply that Cypriot notions may have actually reached the Cyclades via East Aegean, possibly via Rhodes, rather than directly from Cyprus. This is of course a serious discourse upon the assessment of historical and archaeological data, so in the context of this presentation it should only be viewed as a thought rather than an adequately documented suggestion. Thank you for your attention.